Hey guys, this is part two about World War I, and at this point in our story, we are up to an election in 1916. Now you know that when Woodrow Wilson first gains the White House, it was in part because Theodore Roosevelt split the Republican vote when he created a third party called the Progressive or Bull Moose Party because he got mad at William Howard Taft. So Wilson did not enter into office with a giant mandate in fact, if you put together Taft's votes and Roosevelt's votes, he would not have entered into office at all. But he did enter into office and he had to deal with this incredibly devastating war that was raging across Europe. And when he is going to try and get a second term, his platform is one that is very simple. He has kept us out of war. And if you want to stay out of war, he's your best bet. Now I'm going to make an argument. In 1916, I would say that a particular group of Americans decided this election and they're going to give it to Woodrow Wilson because they don't want to see their sons, their husbands, their fathers march off to war in a land that they feel disconnected from. They don't see any American interest in and uh, they really like their husbands, their fathers, their sons, and they, they don't want them to die, which seems pretty rational to me since, of course, I, I have a son who's in the army. So who are these people in 1916? They are women. Women could vote in multiple states in the United States. Now, the suffragettes are getting really loud in front of the White House, and we've been having that movement forever since the 1840s, actually, the Seneca Falls Convention. But we're moving towards a constitutional amendment that will stop any state from denying women's suffrage, regardless of their gender. But, 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 that had not gone through yet, and women still voted in multiple states. You, you remember, I, I believe I've told you before, that women started to gain the vote in the late 1800s in various places. It's just they wanted the constitutional amendment because they thought that they would never be able to get it in some of the more conservative states, especially places in the South. So anyway, this he kept us out of the war platform appeals to them. and. I argue that they decide this election because not women aren't they aren't a huge voting group but when you have a close election a small voting group can be decisive when he went to bed Charles Evan Hughes who was a Republican thought based on the returns that he had seen thus far that he had won that he was gonna he was gonna be president of the United States he wakes up the next day and returns are there for California. Now, California is the furthest state west and um, you know, they're, they're behind in the time zone. I, I don't know how they tabulated the votes so quickly back then. It seems to take us forever and we have way better technology. But um, in California, more than a million votes are cast and it's gonna be decided in Woodrow Wilson's favor by 4,000 votes. That means he's gonna get sway, he's gonna, in the electoral college, as well as the popular vote there, but he's, he's gonna get the electoral vote in California and California is gonna have enough to push him back over the edge. So there are a few things that you should learn from that. Number one, small groups can have big power in close elections. Two, we, close elections in the United States, nothing new. Three, surprise elections in the United States, nothing new. And four, politicians lie because it's going to be uh, no time at all before this promise to continue to keep us out of the war is going to be broken. Why does Woodrow Wilson break his promise? Well, for one, the British are going to tighten their blockade on the Central Powers. Remember, the British have the most powerful navy in the world. So even though we are trading, trading, trading like gangbusters with the Triple Entente, they're 
not going to listen to our opinion about why they should respect our neutrality and allow us to also trade with the central powers who are their enemy. They don't, they don't care about that. And you remember that Kaiser Wilhelm said, yeah, okay, I'll stop using unrestricted U-boat warfare against ships that might affect you, United States, as long as you get the blockade to be lifted. Well, we're, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that. Now, Wilson is still going to be trying to do that, but uh, the press is going to publish something called the Zimmerman Telegram, which is gonna get the public a little riled up. What is a Zimmerman Telegram? Well, first you should understand that there was a guy named Pancho Villa who had actually uh, invaded into the United States from Mexico. And that is a long story that I don't have time to go into here, but he invaded across our Southern border and actually burned down a town. And we, 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 we still kind of remembered that. And then all of a sudden the Zimmerman telegram gets published in the newspapers and it says, uh, hey, it's from a German diplomat. Hey, Mexico, are you guys upset by the fact that the United States controls Texas and all the other territories won in the Mexican-American War? Well, well, I've got a great idea. We, we Germans are extremely good at this military stuff. So if you guys keep the United States busy in your hemisphere until, you know, after we finish beating the butts of the British and the French and the Russians and whatever other triple entente allies there are, we will actually come across the ocean and help you take back your land. Now, I want you, this was never, it was, it was, Mexico was in no position to attack the United States. It was very unstable itself. There, this, this telegram wasn't gonna go anywhere. But British intelligence makes sure that we know about it and it is widely disseminated because the American people find this credible after Pancho Villa. So this is going to kind of push Woodrow Wilson as well. Now, on April 2nd, 1917, which is only a month, a month after he is inaugurated, um, on that platform that he's gonna keep us out of the war, Wilson is going to ask Congress to declare war on Germany. And Congress is gonna oblige. Here, you need to look at Wilson's speech that he gives. This is his, we're gonna make the world safe for democracy speech. And it really shifts the American foreign policy uh, agenda from being one of realist to liberal. After we have the declaration of war, the first thing that the United States is going to have to do is we're going to have to create an army. Um, the United States doesn't have a large standing army in this period. You remember the Spanish-American War was fought in a great part by volunteers. This is because throughout our history, we've always been really suspicious of a large military. But if you're going to engage in a world war, you, you, you need soldiers. So Blackjack Pershing is going to be put in charge of this effort and he will lead the U.S. Army. Unlike the Spanish-American War, you're not going to see droves of volunteers decide that they want to go join in the bloodiest war that human history has ever seen. So what do we do in the United States? We create a draft. That is what selective service is. And this is to have a fast ramp up of troops. You can't just wait to uh, persuade people that this is the right thing to do, as good of a speaker as Wilson is. And you know, a lot of the soldiers are gonna be like, what, 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 what? Isn't there the 13th Amendment which stops the government or anyone from enslaving other people? And isn't this kind of like slavery? You're making me go somewhere and do a job I don't want to do while people are shooting at me and I have no choice. Huh. Well, the, 
the Supreme Court is going to decide that you can't use the 13th Amendment to challenge the draft. So that will be put in place. And Woodrow Wilson will kind of, uh, I don't know, game the system a little bit. He doesn't game the system, but he will support the Espionage and Sedition Acts, which will stop Americans from speaking out against the draft or the war or pretty much anything else. So you will get thrown into jail if you say that you don't like World War I. Um, one guy who gets thrown into jail is a fellow that you've met in the past. His name is Eugene V. Debs, and he's kind of like, you know, the draft. I don't really think that that is very American. But, you know, sorry, Eugene. Now, you can't put everybody in jail, so what you need to do is you need to persuade Americans that this war is worthwhile. And how do you do that? You tell them that the Germans are horrible, horrible, horrible people. In fact, the Huns are monstrous, and they engage in war crimes on a regular basis. Now, to be fair, there were some German war crimes. <laughs> that, that just is true. There are typically always some war crimes in war, but the, the Kaiser's army is not going to be the Nazi army that will come later. So when we depict the Huns as monsters, as you see in the Liberty Bonds poster, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get you on board with killing them. Also, we want you to remember that this is all for humanity because Germany did things like explode the Lusitania. The propaganda poster with the woman holding her baby is based on that event, which was clearly bad. U-boats uh, had destroyed a civilian ship, even if it did have arms again. And um, there was a woman who was found washed ashore holding her baby, and this, which was in all the papers, and this was horrible. So you are going off to war to stop things like that from happening as well. All of this was run by the Committee uh, on Public Information, which was led by a former advertising executive named George Creel, and he is going to be expert at creating propaganda for the state. The United States is ultimately going to sacrifice many thousands of men to the war effort, and we will be engaged in multiple very important battles, including that of the Argonne Forest, which was uh, like the last major push of the Germans to try and turn the tide of war. But the United States is not full of GI Joes in this period. We have very green troops. The reason that we make such a difference is that our men are not tired. They have not been engaged in the trenches. They have not been stuck in mud for years on end. We're, we're the cavalry that's coming in in the end to help. And we do work fairly independently. Um, Blackjack Pershing will direct our troops without being, I don't know, led by our allies. And Wilson allowed him that leverage, which was good. Now, Wilson will want to sue for peace as quickly as possible. And it is interesting to note that Blackjack Pershing did not feel that we should end the war when we did. He felt that the Germans had not been completely and absolutely demoralized and completely and absolutely scattered in the field. And that meant that he thought some Germans would at some point think that they had lost politically, not militarily, and that might give rise to other problems. It's something worth thinking about. Do you have to absolutely crush your enemy or not. I don't know. Wilson was concerned with preserving human life, which he does on one hand, but eh, do some people feel as Blackjack Pershing thought they would feel in Germany? Regardless, the armistice for World War I begins on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. In other words, November 11th at 11 in 1918. Not 1911. The war is over.